It's been a long time since I've done a video on internal medicine, so grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at cardiogenic shock. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notification of such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment. To Zambia and beyond, let's go. If you didn't watch the video on hypovolemic shock, I will leave a card right here that you can go and click and watch before you actually watch this video. I'll actually also leave it tagged at the end of this video. So when you talk about shock, what do we simply mean? Remember there's a cardiovascular failure because the body is supposed to be perfused with blood, which is carrying oxygen and nutrients for the purposes of metabolism, for the purposes of growth and survival. So when there's a failure of the cardiovascular system to perfuse the tissue, this is going to be resulting in disturbed cellular metabolism and function. And as this is going to be as a result of decreased oxygen supply. Remember that metabolism needs oxygen, aerobic respiration. Whenever you cut off this aerobic respiration, tissues are going to be respiring anaerobically, energy systems are going to fail in the body, lactic acid begins to build up. Remember that clinically shock is going to be defined by 20% of sudden blood loss or shift from the peripheral circulation. And the ad for adequate tissue blood, blood flow to actually happen, we need three things to be working together. The blood volume has to be adequate, the myocardial contractility should be adequate, and there should be some peripheral resistance. So any disturbances, any of these three things is actually going to lead to shock. So if the pump fails, it could be cardiogenic or obstructive type of shock, which is what we're going to be talking about in this particular lecture. If there's peripheral circulatory failure, this is going to lead to hypovolemic shock, which is what I did in the previous video. This is often attributed to a decreased blood volume or distributive shock, which is due to a decrease in the peripheral resistance. Now, what are the types of shock? Shock can be classified as hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, as well as distributive. It's not so important clinically, actually it is, but it's more important that you should recognize shock first. And the types of shock can actually be recognized based on the clinical features, on the history, on your physical examination. For example, if you are suspecting that this person has hypovolemic shock, there may be a history of them having some loss of fluid, some loss of blood, it could be through bleeding, it could be through diarrhea, it could be through vomiting. So all that is usually going to be evident within the history, it's going to be evident within the physical examination. So you may not miss that, but you should never miss a patient that is in shock. So remember hypovolemic shock or oligemic shock is due to a diminished blood flow. This is due to loss of fluid or blood, which is in the terms of hemorrhagic shock. Cardiogenic shock is due to an inefficient myocardial function. Obstructive shock is due to a decrease in blood flow to the left ventricle as a result of either cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, or tension pneumothorax. Then the distributive shock, these ones are usually attributed to a peripheral pooling of blood. This can either be septic shock in the background of infections. This is due to systemic infection. Neurogenic shock, which is due to peripheral vasodilatation, reduced peripheral resistance and peripheral pooling of blood. Could be anaphylactic shock, which is mainly an antibody antigen reaction that leads to peripheral pooling of blood. For example, if someone gets an injection of anti-tetanic serum. It could be also endocrine shock, which is due to acute severe hormonal imbalance, for example, in adrenal insufficiency, pituitary failure, and it may present with a combination of any of the above types of shock. Then what you actually have to acknowledge is that a patient can actually present with more than one type of shock. So they could present with hypovolemic shock and they could also present with septic shock. So let's talk about cardiogenic shock as well as obstructive shock. Remember, we already established that the shock is a state where there is organ hypoperfusion with result in cellular dysfunction and death. When you talk about cardiogenic shock, there is just simply an inadequate blood flow to the vital organs, and you know, this is due to inadequate cardiac output despite them having a normal blood volume. When you talk of obstructive shock, on the other hand, this is due to mechanical forces that are going to either impede or interfere with the filling or the emptying of the heart or the great vessels. So shock is going to be characterized by these following features. There's going to be a change in the level of consciousness. In this case, there'll be obtundation, a systemic 
or rather a systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, a 4 in the baseline BP that is greater than 30 millimeters of mercury, urine output less than 0.5 mils per kg per hour, a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute, and a respiratory rate greater than 22. Often they may also have certain specific types of signs and symptoms that you may pick up that may suggest shock. We'll talk about them very shortly. What are some of the causes? For cardiogenic shock, it could be due to abnormality in the cardiac rhythm. For example, with severe arrhythmias, they could either be tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias. It could be impaired myocardial contractility. Myocardial ischemia is the most common cause. And its complications such as ventricular septal rapture. It could be myocarditis, drugs. You could also have some cardiac structural disorders such as acute mitral or aortic regurgitation, rupture of interventricular septum, prosthetic heart valves. Then with obstructive shock, this can either be thought of either as mechanical interference with ventricular filling, that's in the case of tension pneumothorax, carval compressions, cardiac tamponade, atrial tumor, or even a clot. Or it could be in the background of interference with ventricular emptying, that's the massive pulmonary embolism. Now what are some of the clinical features? Now you may have clinical features of the shock, which are going to be things like those that are similar that we talked about with hypovolemic shock, the patient may be comatose, the patient is going to be cold and clammy. This is often due to vasoconstriction and they may have a pulse pressure which is narrow. They will have peripheral cyanosis, poor urine output, increased JVP and a decreased heart sound or rather decreased heart rate. They may have distant heart sounds in the case of specific causes. And then you may have clinical features that are suggestive of specific causes such as an enlarged liver, chest pains, pulse assortinens, a gallop rhythm, a murmur, basal crackles, and even pulmonary edema. In cardiogenic shock, they will have a decreased cardiac index. And remember, cardiac index is found by dividing cardiac output divided by the body surface area. And just to remind you also, you should be able to determine the mean arterial pressure because this will help you also determine how you're going to manage this patient. And our mean arterial pressure is going to be our diastolic pressure plus the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure divided by three. Investigations that would order for include a full blood count to check for the hemoglobin and hematocrit, a cross match for the blood transfusion as well as group and safe, urea and electrolytes, you check for sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate and creatinine, a clotting profile which is going to be including our bleeding time, prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time, these are to rule out any bleeding tendencies. Liver function tests, serum glucose are also quite important. Arterial blood gases that may suggest features of the shock include lactate greater than 3 millimoles per liter, that's about 27 milligrams per deciliter. These are going to be suggesting hypoperfusion. Remember, whenever there is decrease in blood uh, flow, there's going to be anaerobic respiration, there's going to be the production of lactic acid. There is also a best deficit that's less than minus 4 milliequivalents per liter. This also does suggest shock with a carbon dioxide arterial partial pressure of less than 32 millimeters of mercury. Other imaging include cardiorespiratory imaging that's going to be inclusive of an electrocardiograph, chest x-ray which may show an enlarged heart, pulmonary venous congestion, and an echocardiograph. Abdominal ultrasound can also be done to rule out internal hemorrhage and a head CT scan if the patient has a history of head injury or the patient is unconscious. How do we manage shock? We'll begin with cardiogenic shock. So we, our aim of management is pretty much to improve the cardiac output. So we want to correct any dysrhythmias, optimize the preload, improve the cardiac contractility, and reduce the afterload. Then we also want to minimize the cardiac work by maintaining the normal temperature, sedating the patient, intubating them in mechanical ventilation if need be, correcting any anemia, which is why it's very important to get a full blood count. Very, very important thing to ad address is the underlying cause. Most of these patients are going to need ICU care and they're going to need some oxygen therapy and also regularly monitoring of the vitals, the temperature, the heart rate, the blood pressure, and the cardiac monitoring. How do we address the underlying cause? If it's a structural disorder such as a valvular dysfunction, septal rapture, these have to be repaired surgically. Coronary thrombosis is going to be treated by percutaneous coronary interventions such as angioplasty and stenting. You may also treat this with coronary bypass surgery or even thrombolysis. Tachyarrhythmias such as rapid atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia are going to be slowed down by cardioversion or with antiarrhythmic drugs. Bradycardia is going to be treated by either transcutaneous or transvenous pacemaker. But in the interim, as you wait for the pacemaker procedure, you could actually give the matropine 0.5 milligrams IV every 5 minutes for up to 4 doses. 
And if this is not effective, you may switch to isoprotenol, isoproterenol, which is about 2 milligrams and 500 mils of 5% dextrose in water to run at 1 to 4 micrograms per minute. That's about 0.25 to 1 mil per minute. But you do have to remember that in patients that have actually suffered from a myocardial infarction and patients that are suffering from coronary disease, this is a contraindicated drug. In triotic balloon, counterpulsation is actually valuable for temporarily reversing patients that have come in with an acute MI. And remember, this procedure is a bridge that's going to be there between the cardiac catheterization and the coronary angiography before any possible surgical intervention in the patient with acute MI that have complicated by ventricular septal rupture or severe mitral regurgitation who require vasopressor support for more than 30 minutes. Now, what about patients that come in with shock after an MI? Remember, we want to treat them with volume expansion if the pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure, or which is also referred to as a pulmonary artery wedge pressure, is low or normal. So 15 to 18 millimeters of mercury is considered as our optimal range. So remember that our wedge pressure is simply just the pulmonary the, the pressure within the pulmonary artery system when a catheter tip is wedged in the tapering branches of one of the pulmonary arteries. The normal capillary wedge uh, the pulmonary wedge pressure is about 4 to 12 millimeters of mercury, but of course this is not done in most of the hospitals in our setting. If a pulmonary artery catheter is actually not present or not placed, we may actually give fluids cautiously about 250 to 500 mils bolus of normal saline and this is going to be in conjunction with intermittent auscultation of the chest to rule out any fluid overload. But in general experience, we rarely, if we make a diagnosis of cardiogenic shock, we really want to give a lot of IV fluids. We generally want to restrict the IV fluids. Then if they shock after right ventricular MI, these ones usually respond partially to volume expansion. However, vasopressor agents may be needed for these patients. We should also do a bedside cardiac ultrasonography that can assess the contractility as well as the venal cavo respiratory variability, and this can actually determine the need for additional fluids versus the need of vasopressors. Inotropic support is actually better approach for patients that have normal or above normal filling pressures. So how do you use this inotrope? So if a patient has a hypotension that is moderate, that's a mean arterial pressure of 70 to 90, dobutamine can actually be used as it's going to improve the cardiac output and reduce the left ventricular pressure. I did a video on, do on dopamine infusion, so if you haven't yet watched that, please click on this card and head over right there. Dopamine is going to be, or rather dobutamine, is going to be given at 2.5 to 10 micrograms per kg per minute as an infusion. So what you can simply do is get 250 milligrams and place it into 50 mils of 5% dextrose. Tachyarrhythmias as well as other arrhythmias occasionally do occur with dobutamine administration at higher doses, so this can actually necessitate a reduction in the dose. For those that have serious hypotension, that's a MAP less than 70, we want to give them no epinephrine or dopamine and this is going to be given to target the systolic blood pressure to aim for about 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury, but you do not want it to exceed 1 1 10 millimeters of mercury. So dopamine is given at 5 to 10 micrograms per kg per minute as an infusion. We can simply get 400 milligrams and add it to 500 mils of 5% dextrose in water. Evidence actually of dopamine use has actually suggested that dopamine inhibits the secretion of prolactin and this could also increase lymphocyte apoptosis and therefore this can impair the immune response to sepsis. So which is why dopamine may not be one of a good choice in septic shock patients. Norepinephrine on the other hand can be given at 8 to 12 micrograms per minute IV infusion. So initially this is then followed by 2.4 micrograms per minute as a maintenance dose. To make this you want to get 4 milligrams of norepinephrine added to 250 mils or 500 mils of 5% dextrose water which is given as a continuous infusion. For, for our patients, we want to give them prophylactic anticoagulation with aspirin, 75 milligrams, per, 75 milligrams orally once a day and if they're in heart failure and the BP goes above 90, we should treat them as a class 4 type of heart failure. Now how do we manage obstructive shock? For those that have non-traumatic cardiac tamponade, we can actually perform a bedside periocardiosynthesis. For those that have traumatic related cardiac tamponade, these are going to need surgical decompression and repair. For those that have tension pneumothorax, we went to do a needle thoracostomy where we can actually insert a needle, a 21G needle into the second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, and this is later followed by insertion of an intercostal chest drainage tube. 
for massive pulmonary embolism that's going to be resulting in shock. This is often treated with anticoagulation, thrombosis, surgical embolectomy, or sometimes extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in selected cases. I really hope you enjoyed this video on cardiogenic shock as well as obstructive shock. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.